So MQTT, you got questions. What is MQTT? How does it play in industrial automation? This background here, the uh, wind turbines, perfect segue for the conversation that we want to have, especially what is this spark plug specification thing? Stay tuned, we're going to get right to it. My name is Alvaro Martinez. I'm a product manager here at Aviva. And I'm going to just walk you through some of the basics of MQTT and what is it. And I like to show you that through uh, uh, examples. So let's take the case again of uh, the wind turbine uh, energy, which is very, very geographically distributed. How do I bring the information from those devices up to my, uh, let's say, control environment or control room? Or also, how do I bi-directionally communicate with that? Traditionally, there has been some protocols to connect with that, but with uh, the Internet of Things, the ability to communicate with those devices through the Internet, it has become much easier. MQTT was developed many years ago to actually solve cases in our, in our industry, in the oil and gas industry, and uh, it was created to remediate the issue of having to pull every device uh, independently. Now, through our software portfolio, through our Viva portfolio, we actually can manage those devices individually, as I show here on the screen. We can bring up the configuration down to those devices, and by the nature of the MQTT protocol, which we're going to discuss more details moving forward, then those devices can start communicating up into a broker concept that we're going to discuss as well, into system platform. So let's first break down uh, the MQTT layer, the topology of an MQTT network. At the bottom, the first thing that you would have is the devices. Uh, traditionally, in our industry, not everything is automated to natively speak uh, MQTT protocol. Uh, if I haven't said it before, MQTT stands for Message Queue Telemetry Transport, a very lightweight mechanism of packaging data and sending it over. Now, the devices at the bottom, again, as I was mentioning, it can be anything from, let's say, transmitters, thermocouple, motor controls, motor states. But uh, again, as I mentioned, they typically not connected directly to an uh, IoT network. So how do we deal with that? Well, let's say uh, you have local PLCs or RTUs. Our software, the Aviva Edge software, our communication drivers, have the capability to connect to those PLCs locally. So we can leverage those capabilities. So again, the bottom part of the uh, layer, edge of network devices. Then the next layer that comes up is the edge of network node or a gateway. Now what the gateway does is it locally communicates to those devices in their local protocols. It can be Modbus, it can be uh, Siemens, it can be RTUs, ROC, whatever the case of those local protocols are, we communicate those via the Aviva Edge gateway, which again is one of our software offerings in our portfolio. Then we also configure connectivity to an MQTT broker. Now, what is the MQTT broker? That is the next part in the equation of the MQTT network. The broker is nothing more than a software component in the architecture. But the beauty of the broker is that it distributes the load so that the, the devices in the network don't have to communicate directly with the supervisory application. The broker accepts the messages from the publishers, which is uh, the messages coming from our edge of network devices. They accept those devices and then they relay the information to those other devices that are subscribed to them. So there's the difference between traditional, let's call it polling connectivity versus MQTT network, which has a concept of report by exception. Report by exception means that you don't have to pull the device to ask it for data. All you're doing is subscribing to the data that you're interested in, and then the broker will only send you the data that is relevant to you. So it's very efficient in terms of communication. If bandwidth is an issue, which in a lot of this geographically distributed architecture is a problem, this is perfect for those architectures. Moving forward into the network of MQTT are the clients to the broker. So as I mentioned, the bottom part, you have the publishers posting information into the broker, and then you will have some interested parties that will want to subscribe to some of the data. It doesn't have to be all the data. It can be subset of the data depending on their interest of the network. They're going to subscribe to those things. 
And in MQTT, those things are called topics. And basically, topics are, you know, as you're interested in any topic there, they can be just the temperatures that you're interested in from all these devices. You don't, So you don't have to subscribe to everything. Now, also in MQTT, and we'll talk a little bit more about Sparkplug, where Sparkplug comes into play in the industrial environment, it's the top of the tier, which is what a concept called the SCADA host application. And in a Sparkplug space architecture, this SCADA host application, there should only be one in the entire network because think about it, this is the master of the entire architecture. Think about it as being the mothership. And there's a couple of reasons for that. All right, so let's move forward back to our example that we uh, talked a little bit uh, earlier, which is uh, the wind power type application. Each one of those devices are going to have one or multiple connected uh, smart things to it. And those things can be sensors, they can be PLCs, they can be RTUs, which obviously going to be controlling, monitoring, and collecting the data of that device. Now, as we started to mention earlier, how can we bring that into our, into our system platform application? So Aviva Edge is a perfect component there where you can configure it to talk to those local devices in their local language, you know, for vendor X or Y, and then collect that information and package it and send it over to the broker and then coming in into system platform. Now, that packaging, as it relates to the industrial specification, is important. So the Eclipse Foundation uh, brought up a standard, and it was labeled the Sparkplug example. Uh, sorry, the Sparkplug specification. Now, that specification has really three main goals that we're just about to uh, describe. But the key here is by leveraging the Sparkplug specification, the, the reason for that is in the industrial arena, we want all the vendors that are participating into an MQTT network to behave the same way. That way, the consuming applications don't have to do, you know, custom code or specific things to be able to understand that. And obviously, from a control perspective, it is very important that those standards are followed. So let's go and describe the three main goals of the industrial specification for MQTT, the Sparkplug specification brought up by the Eclipse Foundation. So goal number one is the namespace standardization. In the traditional MQTT, there's the concept of uh, MQTT will send the data in JSON format. JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. And it's nothing more than a name value pair, and it can be very simple or it can be complex. Now, for the purpose of that, the hierarchy of the naming scheme in the traditional MQTT can be very wide and varied. For the purpose of the industrial arena, the Sparkplug specification dictates that you really can only have three levels of hierarchy within the namespace. So the first level will be what is called the group level. And that really has no content in itself except being used for uh, naming and grouping the different devices out in the field into a group section. The second part of the specification is the edge of network node or gateway which can have data in itself. So it can, it can act as an edge of network device, but traditionally what it does is it actually aggregates data for devices underneath it, which is the third part of the specification, which is the edge of network devices, right? So what this does, it helps standardize the schema of the namespace. So again, so that the client applications can easily understand that payload when it comes to them, and they'll have to do custom work to be able to distill that information and be able to leverage it in the applications. The second part of the specification is the payload standardization. What I just mentioned was that uh, when you send packages through MQTT, it uses the JSON format. The JSON format can have any internal format. It can be simple. It can be structured. For the purpose of MQTT Spark Plug, the specification has defined a format that it wants the vendors to use. So when uh, you send a payload as an MQTT Sparkplug payload, it would follow that JSON scheme. And as you can see here is the schema when in the client application, I'm showing here the browser of our MQTT communication driver, will understand automatically the content of that package and can display for you for browsing purposes or for any purposes in your application. It doesn't have to be a flat namespace inside the payload itself, you can actually have a built-in structure as well. And the uh, third part 
of the specification is the life cycle. And as I mentioned a little bit ago, there's also this concept of the SCADA host application. But in traditional MQTT, there's this concept of a death certificate that was introduced in MQTT. Basically, the death certificate is to tell the broker application what to do when that device goes away and disappears. The SparkLab specification has extended this life cycle to be a little bit more contained and specific from the industrial application. So one of the things that it has added in addition to what we call the death certificate before, which again define what that uh, device was expected to do when it was no longer available, is the additional concept of the birth certificate. What the birth certificate does, it basically tells the broker what is this device look like? You know, what is the taxonomy of that device, that hierarchy, all the tags that are in the device and their structure. So it sends that information initially to the broker as part of the birth certificate. It sends the initial values from the device, so you have that initial information. And then it also sends the death information or the last will testament with it. And so as an example, every device that is part of the network will send this information to the broker so that the client applications have that information readily available to them. And again, as part of the life cycle of MQTT, remember that the MQTT is report by exception. So there's never any polling except for the fact that there's a heartbeat that is configurable between the clients and the broker or the publisher and the broker. And this heartbeat basically will tell the broker if the device is still there or if the device has been you know, disconnected uh, for maintenance purposes or the device has died. And then based on that, because the broker has the last will testament information, it will send that information to the devices that have subscribed to the broker. So let's kind of conclude here by showing you a little bit of an end-to-end -end demo of how we can facilitate moving information through the, through the system using our, uh, our software. So we'll start with the Edge, with our Aviva Edge software. First, we will configure connection to a field device. And as an example, we're going to connect to a Modbus device and send the connectivity to those, start collecting the data to the Modbus device. Then in the application, we'll also configure connectivity to an MQTT broker and we'll model, let's say, two well fields that we're monitoring in that local region. Once we activate the data, again, key to understand that MQTT is report by exception. So we will only publish values that change and we will actually adjust the payload to only send the devices that change. On the other side, on, in the system platform side, through our communications driver, we can actually browse the devices that are available and we can browse either by hierarchical scheme or by geolocation in case you want to pinpoint the devices from a specific location. And obviously because of the nature of MQTT and the SparkPlug specification, we can then automatically know the taxonomy of that device and browse the specific instances of that. And then we can start integrating this into our client applications, whether it's system platform, in touch, historian, or other, and using basically the natural capability and the uh, different hierarchy components of system platform, then we can start bringing that information in and automatically building that whole structure. So if you have a lot of scalability in your application, as the case of it is with, uh, let's say, wind power or oil and gas or water, wastewater, smart cities, even globalization of production facilities, you can bring that up. And using the power of our software, uh, including object wizards and other capabilities, as you add components and devices into your architecture, then you can automatically start uh, bringing that up into your application. So this is almost a concept of edge to enterprise, right? Bringing all that information together. Simple. So let me know what you think about the video, what other subjects uh, you would like to be informed on. Uh, what more do you want to learn? Uh, ex any specific examples of how to configure parts of the software, how to leverage more NQTT. And obviously, don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for watching.